So there I was, sitting in my office, dreading that phone call that I was going to have to have with the customer, giving them horrible information that I didn't want to have to give. It was 2007, and uh, the organization that I was with at the time was, was uh, using many different kinds of content management platforms. We had a custom system that we had built. Uh, we'd engaged with a customer who was a startup, and they were building an online community for music where artists could upload uh, music to their, their own music uh, to the site and they could, uh, people could purchase products, their artist products, purchase the artist's music, upload tablature. It was gonna be a large online community that would compete with Last.fm. And uh, we'd gone through a discovery process and we had identified who all the users were, we had done branding, we had spent about four, and a half, four or five months uh, going through a pretty stringent discovery. We had created wireframes for the project. And uh, uh, I found out after about a week and a half or two weeks of development that the systems that we, we were trying to integrate together to get all of this to work weren't going to be able to speak to each other. They had completely different structures. They had completely different kind of database uh, structures on the back end. And uh, it, was, it was really a mess. And instead of picking up the phone, I started speaking with my boss, and he had been down at South By, and he mentioned that he had heard of this content management system called Drew Paul or Drew Pal or Drupal, and uh, it was supposedly this very innovative solution that was very flexible, and he said, why don't you go check that out? And I'm not, I'm not a technical person at all. And so uh, he had installed it for me, um, basically taught me how to upload new modules, and so I was off and running. Within a week and a half, we started looking at what I built uh, with creating some content types, um, with checking out different user permissions. And I had, at about a week and a half, gotten farther along within developing, developing the site than a team of our developers, I believe there were 12 guys working on the project at the time, had gotten in a matter of four weeks. And so at that point, I think for us, was a, a pivotal moment, not only in my career, but for that organization. Uh, six months later, we had the project completed on time. It was within budget. The customer was very happy that they had a solution that gave them more power than they thought that they were going to have. And six months after that, our company had completely changed our business model to really revolve around Drupal. Uh, we had moved to becoming a very lean organization, uh, implementing agile processes. We had changed the way that we sell projects. Uh, we had changed our project management approach, obviously moving away from Waterfall. And uh, it was a transition point for that organization. I think that you'll hear that story is probably very common uh, throughout the Drupal community and a lot of the successful agencies uh, uh, and how they got into Drupal and how they've been able to shift uh, their business model because of Drupal. My name is Brent Bice. I now work with FFW. And I'm join, joining me today is Holly Bound. She is the digital strategy leader for GE Energy Connections. She has a very similar story, and I want you two guys to hear her story today of how GE got into Drupal and what it's meant for her business. So we're going to be discussing uh, uh, delivering business results beyond your typical clicks and conversions. Um, I'm sure everyone here, show of hands, if you've heard of GE before, most likely you have. It, and so uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about FFW, if you don't mind. Um, we're an organization that is, is built on technology, driven by data, and focused on user experience. We have 250 Drupal developers, 75 of which are Acquia certified, making us the largest Drupal agency on the planet. And I don't think that bigger is better. I think that better is better. And I honestly believe that we're, in many ways, both without offending anyone in the room. And, and I'll tell you why. I think that, that we look at measurable results in everything that we do. I think that we're a very transparent and very disciplined and very lean team. And more than anything, I think that we hire the right people for our organization because in our business, people are our greatest asset. And above and beyond that, we always put our customers focused from the top down, coming from the CEO, that we put our customers and our customers' needs and helping them reach their goals beyond everything that we do. In today's world, companies that want to get ahead and stay ahead have to put their customer at the center of all of their thinking 
making sure that all products and services fit seamlessly into customer desires and behaviors. And to me, that requires really an outside in approach to how you run your business, starting with and understanding what your customers' needs are and staying laser focused on that and moving that back through the chain from sales to marketing to customer service, working in as, as one team driven around helping your customers achieve their goal rather than working in silos like so many businesses do. And so it's a, it's a bit of a different approach that I think more successful companies are starting to take. And when you really put your customer first and think about your customer first and think about their needs first, you benefit from that. You gain customers more easily. You gain them faster. You retain customers for longer. You drive more revenue for your business, which all of those things in turn create efficiencies, if you think about it, for your company because your sales team doesn't have to work as hard to sell things. Your marketing team doesn't necessarily have to work as hard to market because you're keeping these customers around. And I think for these reasons and putting our customers first, we're trusted by many of the world's largest organizations, most well-known brands, to help them not only implement tools to reach a broader audience, to increase conversion, to sell more products, but we're focused on helping them achieve internal uh, em empowerment for their business so that their marketers can do their jobs by more easily creating and generating content for their customers and giving their customers the things that they want. We help uh, create efficiencies by not only looking at the front end of websites, but looking how Drupal on the back end can be a better user experience and how we can make it more simple for groups to, to work together uh, uh, by improving internal communication, by helping to reduce as much as possible project risk. And so always focusing um, not only on those clicks and conversions, but focusing on creating internal efficiencies for the clients that we work with. And what we're finding is that, you know, success isn't always about clicks and conversions. Yes, it's mostly about revenue. Um, but looking at ways to leverage technology um, outside of just clicks and conversions, especially geared around websites, because Drupal is so much more than just a web content management solution. Um, helping to improve administrative processes or delivering more ROI, and that's a big, big work today in, in today's business. More and more, we're seeing that CMOs and CIOs are having to not only you know, buy new products and build new products, but do more with less. That's huge in the university space when I'm, when I'm talking to higher education. Sometimes these guys are having to maintain and support you know, more than 150 websites with a team of less than five people. And that can be very challenging in today's world and they can't get the budgets that they need. And so looking for ways that, that Drupal or really in a, any technology can help them do their jobs faster, do their jobs better. Um, and we're also seeing that, that people are starting to kind of look outside of the box and not necessarily thinking of Drupal as a web content management platform. Uh, we're finding that people are building content repositories. Perhaps if you're a pharma company and uh, uh, you're looking at perhaps OPDP regulations, for example, um, creating content repositories or workflows or ways to help, uh, to help bring insights to that so that you can uh, stay in touch with, with regulatory compliance. Um, we're seeing people build learning management system, systems for their internal sales teams to, uh, to teach and to drive for, you know, for education. We're finding um, even more groups that are using it, obviously, as intranets. We're seeing Drupal used as backend for, for, uh, for headless applications or native applications. So it's being used in a lot of different ways. We're also seeing that people are, are really simplifying their platform management. I think that this is something that Holly will be speaking to quite a bit with her journey through Drupal. Um, imagine, if you will, a large organization, universities, I, I, I can continue to go back to them because uh, they have this challenge all the time. See it in every university that, that I've spoken with and work with, is that they work in silos, they're not working as one team, uh, they're broken up into se basically separate business units and they'll have various different technologies on the back end, whether it's running .NET or PHP, uh, Drupal, WordPress, Sitecore, they have all of these different systems. Now imagine the efficiencies that you could perhaps get if you work together and decided upon one platform, bringing it into one solution, and then either through multi-site or through distributions, however you set that up, 
you can then only focus on managing that one application, that one platform, the efficiencies that your business gains from that. Obviously, you have a reduction of systems and platforms, which also reduces the number of vendors that you have to communicate with on a daily basis. Contract negotiation and paperwork can significantly be reduced. These aren't things that, that people generally think of when they're creating KPIs around websites, but they are things that are very important to your business. You can, you can improve your internal training programs and documentation instead of, have, instead of having to be experts at four or five different systems and having to do training with your team around these four or five different systems, you can train uh, on one system. And then of course, leveraging tools across your business, uh, uh, units to create more efficiencies. Um, perhaps if, if you have one group that needs a certain feature, then they can build that feature out of their budget and that feature could be distributed to the other groups within the organization, um, or they could collectively pool their money to create certain features that they need. It creates efficiency, it reduces cost, et cetera. So don't take my word for it. Today, uh, again, I'm gonna introduce Holly. If you guys will give her a big round of applause, and I want her to tell her story about GE Energy Connections and their transition into to lean and, and, and what Drupal's meant for them. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Holly Bounds. I work for what is called GE Energy Connections. Formerly, it was GE Energy Management. Before that, it was GE Energy. Uh, GE is, um, has been known to acquire a company here and there over you know, its many years of business. And so over a period of time, with all these acquisitions, that also meant that we acquired a great many content management systems and hosting platforms. And when I say hosting platform, I really mean it was a server under somebody's desk that they also used as a footrest. Uh, we also have a lot of ERP systems. We have several e-commerce systems, um, several marketing automation systems. So we had quite the, the, um, the inventory of platforms. So what started this um, was that in 2012, GE Energy um, decided that it was too large and that we were going to break into three businesses, GE Oil and Gas, GE Power and Water, and GE Energy Connections. Each of us would now report up to our investors, and what that means is our revenue would be reported separately to our investors. Investors want to be able to go somewhere and see what they've invested in. So we had to build a site, right? Because we'd all been one site, now we needed to build three sites. Or in my case, six sites. And then eventually 40 sites. But anyway, that's, a, that's the way things work. So the vision though, as I inherited all of these disparate systems, and, um, and one thing I will share with you, so as we had the conversation, we asked the poll in the room, who's, devel who's developer, who's IT? Um, my degree is in English. I have a specialization in British literature, and I have a sub-specialization in Shakespeare. That qualifies me to teach or get married, and I've done neither of those. <laughs> uh, so imagine what it's like when I've gone from producing content for a website to building a website and deciding how to host a website, and what's a content management system? I, I just type stuff in and it pops up on the screen. I don't really know. So it was quite a, it was quite a different um, journey to go to the other side um, so to speak, and, uh, and, and learn the back end and make the decision on what, how we were gonna build out. So because I don't have an IT or technical background, really I looked at the vision for where did we want to be, really focused around, as Brent said, what does my customer want? I sell really big, not really pretty electrical equipment, and you're not probably gonna see it most of the time. It's in the, the Kia motor, plant or the Budweiser bottling facility or a big substation that's down in your neighborhood and you think, man, that thing is an eyesore and it's dropping my property value. That's all my stuff and I find it beautiful. It's a lovely shade of ANSI number 63. Anyway, what does my customer want? What do they need from me? How do they get, how do they want to get information so that they make a, they can make a buying decision? That's what's important to me. It's unfortunate in the program that they said delivering business results beyond revenue. That was a typo, because you will learn very quickly, Megan Trainer is all about that base, Holly Bounds is all about that revenue. I very much believe that we all, every one of us, 
exist to sell a product. If we don't, we go out of business, we get a pink slip and we go home. So for me, it's how do I make it a better user experience, customer experience for my end customer. So we wanted to be able to build, yes, an attractive website, of course, it's GE and we have a brand to maintain. We also wanted, to be, wanted our customers to be able to search and find exactly what they needed to find in the fewest number of clicks. That's not new. Um, we wanted them to, be, to, to get um, information at all stages of the buyer journey, from that very early beginnings when they're doing an investigation of do I even have a problem, do I want to do anything about that problem, um, to, to evaluating and shortlisting um, customer, uh, suppliers. We wanted them to have that information that they need and that approximately 70% of the buyer journey that happens online before they ever talk to a salesperson. So we wanted, we wanted our, our user experience to be the most, that, that was the center focus for us on how to move forward. We also knew that a website is static. It's, it's, it's like flypaper. You've got to drive people there. It's like you built a house and then didn't give anybody the address. Nobody's ever going to come visit you. So you put out, you send out your open house invitation, right? So we wanted, we also were looking at our outbound promotion. How do we drive traffic um, to our website? So that was a, that was very important to us. Um, we wanted to know who is coming to our website, and conversely, who's not coming to our website, because that's just as important to us. We have very key segments and key accounts, and we wanted to be able to serve those customers very specifically. We also divide our audiences into personas and we develop content that's particular to those personas. So those were all of the, the, the key pieces that were in our vision of what to build, the experience to build. We started there, not the technology. We figured out what we needed it to be for our end customer and then build backwards um, from there. So this is the starting point. Um, we started, like I said, with GE Energy, we broke into three companies. That meant that my business, GE Energy Management, became GE Energy Connections, needed its own website. Um, we, had, um, we had a company called GE Power Conversion. It used to be called Converteam. It was, it was an acquisition. They were in the process of being merged into the GE Energy website when GE Energy went away. So they needed a website. It needed to be migrated from, I don't even know, a content management system? I have no idea. Um, we had another group called Energy Consulting. They were integrated into the Energy website, so now they needed their own website. Um, we had uh, GE Industrial Solutions that had their own website, roughly 32 different websites. Those were the ones that were under people's desks. Um, they all needed to be migrated. Um, in the midst of all of this, we acquired another company, and they became part of the fold. They were in yet another platform. Um, and then we had one more site um, that has not yet migrated to Drupal. It's in a homegrown CMS. So it was, it, was, it was a spider web of different systems. Honestly, I couldn't even tell you all the content management systems we had. I really don't know what they were, and I don't care, um, because that wasn't the end goal. For me, the value, is the value is the content I provide to the customer, not what's running in the back end. In amongst all of our, um, our visioning of what we wanted to do, we had a cross-business team from our different business units, our different P&Ls, and we had them decide, what do you want to do? What, so now that we know what we, what we want it to be, what technology do you want to use? So they went through the process, this was before I was ever hired, and decided that they wanted to go with open source. And then from there, they decided um, between Joomla and Drupal, and they chose Drupal. And that's the point that I picked up the program um, and it was up to me to put out the RFP, find a vendor, and start the bill process. I was introduced to Acquia by Serious Decisions. And um, from working with Acquia, we used them as our systems architects. They introduced us to what was known as Blink Reaction at the time. It has since been acquired, <laughs> the theme. Um, and that's FFW agency now. Um, in talking to Acquia, uh, they said, by the way, GE.com, corporate site is being deployed in Drupal next month. We're like, really? We had no idea. We thought we were the only ones. So that we Im immediately created our own little two-person community within GE to, to share information on Drupal. Um, so th that's how our, our, our journey began with Drupal. 
and over time started the integration process. One thing that really helped me a lot was our CEO, uh, Jeff Emmelt, began simplification. That was, that's an initiative within GE, the simplification. And you can do a lot when you term something as a simplification project. And this truly was simplification because it, it eliminated a lot of different, as, as Brent alluded, a lot of different content management systems, a lot of which were proprietary, which involves cost, and a lot of time negotiating contracts and managing licenses. And, I mean, that's, that can take up a lot of time that you should otherwise be spending creating content for your end customer. Um, same thing with hosting. It, it was, we managed to eliminate just a lot of useless effort um, by consolidating to a single content management system and a single hosting platform. And that allows us to focus on our end customers. Like I said, one of the things that um, that was was really important to us as we walked worked our way through this and made a decision, made some major decisions, was who owns the web. At that time, IT owned the web. IT said as long as it was stable and nobody hacked it, it was good. Okay, but I'm not selling websites, right? I'm selling beautiful power equipment. So we made the decision internally that we were gonna change ownership uh, to marketing, and really not just marketing. It's marketing, sales, communications, and IT. We have, we have the, the four <laughs> forces of the apocalypse that own the web and the web experience because communications uses it uh, to communicate our messaging, our brand message, our product message to investors, to um, to talent that, that might be interested in coming to work for GE, um, to, to students to uh, who are working on their dissertation, um, to the folks that we want to, to buy our product. So community, it's important to communications, it's important to sales. We are driving a lot of our, um, a lot of our revenue through e-commerce these days. And then of course the marketing wanting to introduce products. So it, it really was important for us to, to share the ownership um, of this, of our web and web property. So that was a very big change um, for us and one that took some, some time and some consideration. Um, another big piece was making the decision to host externally with Acquia. Now it seemed, now at GE, everybody's moving to AWS, but at the time I moved, nobody was hosting outside GE data centers. So the big concern was that we would get hacked. Okay, and they get my brochureware. I want them to have that. I, I don't care. Um, so that was that was a a lot of discussion that went around that. Um, but when we, when we went through the process and we had some really great IT team teammates who worked with us said, you know, we've done we've done their due diligence on Acquia and their platform is perfectly safe. We're not worried. And by the way, they're more cost effective than we are. Okay, I've got your blessing. So that was that was a turning point. And again, four four years later, it seems like nothing. But at the time, it was. I mean, you can't imagine how many hours we spent deliberating these things. But in the end, uh, that's what we've done. We've con we've consolidated on Drupal, and we host with Acquia. So this is the timeline of of how this all occurred. Uh, so I, like I said, I started in 2012 in October October 17th, and. Um, very quickly moved in this project. Uh, one of the things that's so incredibly special about today is that I got to meet the developers who built all these sites. We've been working together since November of 2012 and we've never met. So that is, if that doesn't show you how a virtual team can work well together, I can't imagine, um, I can't imagine a better uh, example. So Maria and Dennis are here from FFW. Again, never, never met them before today. So I'm so incredibly excited um, to share this. Now what I would say it would be very interesting if Maria came, stood up here and we all had a cocktail and she shared her side of the story, I'm sure <laughs> it'd be very different <laughs> what it was like to work with the English major um, to build these websites. But this is how we how we built ours out. Um, we worked with Acquia from the very beginning to do our system architecture. So they helped us from the beginning and they introduced us to FFW and they built our first site. We went with a different vendor for our second site. Um, we went with uh, with a local agency, and when we moved to our third, went to build our third site, which is a migration. Um, Maria and team discovered that they had um, 
there were issues with the code that made multi-site not work. So they invested a great amount of time uh, rectifying that problem. Because when I will show you in a minute what, what our site structure looks like, but we are, we're multi-site within multi-site. Um, I heard a presentation earlier today when someone said, that who's heard of multi-site? Who's heard of positive and negatives multi-site? And everybody kind of groaned. I love it. It is the greatest thing ever. I, I think it's the most fabulous thing ever. And I'm a strong proponent. When we built all of these sites out, our leadership had, um, at that time, um, our mandate was every business unit's website has to be portable because we're looking to sell off or move around the business each of these companies, each, each of these divisions. So we were acting as a holding company. So that was the mandate. Each one has to be able to take their site, their <laughs> folder, and move it somewhere else. So that was a consideration from, from day one, and that will limit you, um, but that's, that's what we had to work with. And so far, like I said, multi-site within multi-site has been perfect for us. Um, we're at the point now where we have the majority of our sites built out, including country sites for one of our P&Ls uh, that are in local language. We have one more major site to migrate from their, their homegrown content management system, uh, but, but it's, been, it's been all positive for us. We've, we've gone back to FFW um, for the majority of our sites. One site is built by a company out of San Diego. They continue to work with us, and we're, they push their code to FFW, and Marie and her team test it across all of our sites and then push it um, f live on Thursday. So for us, I, at least, in my opinion, um, it's a pretty good story that we can run this many sites, multi-site within multi-site, on a single dock route, which, apologies to Acquia, but it saves me a ton of money in, in hosting cost. And like I said, I'm all about the revenue. And if we went a separate dock route for every site, that's a lot of money. And I don't, I don't sell websites. My company customers don't buy them, so therefore it's, not a, it's just a cost for me. So um, for us, being able to have multiple vendors, if our P&Ls really want to work with different developers, we can do that. Um, it, it works beautifully for us also because we can push um, content, or sorry, push code, uh, site-wide code changes. It allows us to, it, very quickly, with GE, we protect our brand very, very carefully. And so keeping all of our sites within a template, a template, they have, they each look a little bit different, but in general, when you look at it, it's a GE site. You will, all, you will know it's a GE site. And this way, using multi-site within multi-site, we can keep everybody within that GE look and feel. So it's been very, very positive for us. So this is current state. Um, this is all of our different websites that, that Maria and team have built out for us. A lot, you'll notice a lot of them are country-specific sites. That's important because that beautiful equipment that I told you about, um, some of that is can only be used in North America. Some of it can only be used in Europe. Um, some, com some companies in Europe own utilities in the US. They need to be able to buy both IEC rated products and IEEE products. So there, each of these sites has content that's very specific to the region where that equipment is, is, is useful. So that's why we've had to build up these country-specific sites. It's not just language, it's the content as well. So the, these are our results, we'll read them all to you. Um, I will tell you that that, re that that cost savings number is very low. Um, I'm not gonna tell you exactly what it is. Um, I don't commit any of that to paper or photo. Um, that's, that was for one, um, one P&L alone, and there's six of us. So I mean, you can imagine um, what, what we've been able to achieve for our business and cost savings. Um, the outsourced hosting, like I said, is 22% less expensive to go with Drupal, I mean go with Acquia than to host it internally. Um, one thing that I've loved about the having Acquia host is it's not my problem. Isn't that full SCP, someone else's problem? When Heartbleed bug hit, it's not my problem. <laughs> Just fix it. And I cannot tell you how wonderful that was to not be on the hook for figuring that out. Um, and then my, my last, again, business reason for doing this is it's, I would tell you to focus on value. I mean, if you're a developer, IT person, whatever, and you're looking to, to partner with marketing and communications, if you're marketing, communications, sales, looking to partner with IT, focus on where you add value. Where does your, not just you, but your company, 
Where do you add value to your end customer? For me, I don't add value to, a, to an electric utility by hosting my own website or developing content. I mean, or, sorry, developing a website. I, I, that's not my value. So we're outsourcing all those things where we don't specifically add value. So we have a few things that are still in the works. We have a few more sites to get live in Drupal. Um, we're looking to roll out uh, a pilot that we did with a company called Baynote. Um, they do pr uh, dynamic product recommendations. They've done, um, we've seen excellent work um, from them. Um, FFW helped us build out the, um, the interface, the, um, the product catalog that was running in the background for them. So still needed developers to help us with that. Um, the idea behind that is instead of your product people putting together product recommendations that are static, they put them together and maybe don't look at that page again for another year. These recommendations are based on actual people's search habits on your site. So if someone has looked at page A, page B, and then page C, the next person looks at page A and page B, it's going to serve up page C as a recommendation. Our results on that pilot, we saw a 527% increase on click-throughs based on versus the ones that my product managers did, not to knock my product managers. But what my next goal was is I wanted to see from there how many people click through to our online portal to, to buy, or they clicked on where to buy, which led them to a distributor. And my results were an 1,800% increase in click throughs to either the online web port or the e-commerce portal or where to buy. So that's important to me because again, it's about revenue. So we look to roll that out. And we're also working with another, another company called Demandbase. Uh, we use their software to see, or their, their code to show us exactly what companies are coming to our sites. And then we're building customized landing pages so that when someone comes from an IP address for Microsoft, it'll show a page that's customized for Microsoft. We're doing the same thing with our key industries. So based on SIC codes or NAICS codes that Demandbase detects, then we can serve up a page that has content that's, um, that's specific to that industry, and FFW created those templates for us as well. And then our other big one is because we have so many different sites, just within Energy Connections, and then with our brethren over in GE Power, and GE Oil and Gas, and GE Digital, um, we're looking at rolling out a Google search appliance that will search across all of those sites, so that you don't have to understand my org structure um, to be able to put together a multi-product uh, solution for your for your, for your product project. So those are the few things that we're working on um, for 2016. <laughs> I like that. You look, yeah, so thank you very much, Holly, for, for, for sharing. And so I think at the end of the day, I mean, key takeaways from, from you know, discussions I've had with Holly and looking at her presentation from, from uh, my background and experience with projects that I've worked on is, is you, know, you really have to keep a client first mentality in everything that you do and shaping that again, kind of bringing it from the top and move uh, uh, the decisions that you make backwards, I think, uh, uh, can help you become more successful. Of course, assessing strategic initiatives and just you know based on value, um, uh, and, and working in as at one team rather than in silos, I think is, is hugely important uh, for organizations. Um, and, and one of the things that, that I thought you said that was that was very important, I think it's important you know, regardless of the technology, but but choosing the right partners to work with uh, can be huge. Uh, there are a lot of agencies, a lot of organizations out there who say they can do certain things, who, who uh, put PHP code into uh, you know, a field, open you up for perhaps a, a SQL injection or something like that. And so make sure, or, or building your site in a way that, that moves it out of multi-site, so make sure that when you're, when you're selecting partners or when your team is implementing a project, make sure that you're doing it correctly uh, so that you don't have to go back and do a lot of rework and, and, and waste a lot of everyone's time. Um, and so we'll, we'll keep it at that. Again, my name is uh, Brent Bice. work with FFW. If you guys have questions, we'll open up the floor. Uh, I'm sure Holly's more than happy to, to, to answer any questions that you might have. Um, anyone? Was the, uh, well, I'm not going to take your question. So. What's your question, John? Um, 
Uh, thanks you for Holly. So first of all, I thought you did a great job kind of like putting it concisely. Give me an idea of, of kind of the, the timeline for you. There was obviously in the parents like there's a lot of decision making from start to finish. You said four years, was that what I gathered or to the team um, for the one last site um, for Grid Solutions and said, do you want to go straight with eight? Um, Aquia assures me that I can run seven and eight on the same dock route. Um, do you want to go with eight? And they said, we don't choose to be bleeding edge. Um, we're good to go with seven, and then we'll all migrate together, and you know, we'll, we'll, solve, we'll all row the same boat. Um, so that's, that's our plan as it stands today. Good job, Maria. You've worked us out of work. <laughs> There, exactly. 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 I guess you. Oh, yeah. I, I just um, had a question about support. So it sounds like, you know, we heard a lot about the build project for all these sites, and I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you handle the day to day support for the site that you're auditing. Um, there's this ticketing system called Jira. <laughs> I go oh, into yeah. it and I. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. 
Okay, so one of the things that I, that I would share with you is of all the sites that you saw, and I told you I have another development team, um, I have a retainer agreement with, um, with FFW for 35 hours per month. So I have less than one person for, for less than a week of a person to maintain all of these sites for us. So um, I think, pat myself on the back, um, I think that's a testament for what I've been able to get my team to, get to consolidate and work together and share templates and all work on the same doc group and share code base um, so that we don't require Marie and her team to spend so much time supporting so many different sites um, for us. Yes, she worked herself out of Brent, out of, you know, and Matt out of work, but and that's, again, that's what was important to us was we wanted this to be, we wanted to be able to focus all of our folks on updating content. Um, one of the things, too, and where did, where did Ray go? Right here. There he is. So, and I just met Ray today, too. Um, we have content managers around the world. All, all of our product ma managers, product marketing managers, are all trained to up, upload their own content. They all have logins, they all, whatever time zone they're in, when they have a head of new information, they post it themselves. It does not go to Maria, it does not come to me. They're all trained to do it, and Ray trained every one of them. So that's something that was really important to us. We, we had work, we have a workflow process before where you put in a three page workflow to move a comma and waited 24 hours and you checked online and the comma was in the wrong place. So we went back to the workflow, three pages later you submit it again and waited another 24 hours. There was no way I was willing to deal with that. And so that's what we've done. We trust, I mean, these are GE employees. We trust them to develop product. We trust them to sell it to our customer. We trust them to install equipment that could, well, it keeps the lights on. We're, just, we're not gonna go the negative. So I trust them to get on my content management system and update their own product. They, they know that content more than it, better than anybody else. So that's what we've done is we've really decentralized the, the content management process. And that's that's been a huge, huge savior for us. And again, goes back to our vision of making sure that we put our content um, in the hands of our customers so that they have information they can go to find it. That kind of goes back, I think, to that efficiency as well as working with one platform rather than having to maintain and support perhaps seven different platforms. Maria, would you like to speak to that a little bit? Uh, the, the good thing that Colin managed to do with this multi-site is not just having a multi-site, but having a consistency throughout those sites. So, and when she says multi-site within multi-site, a good example for that is the 40, almost 40 sites that we have, maybe not all of them are live, but almost 40 sites that we have for Gene Doctor Solutions, they all have the same, uh, functionality. They have different content, different languages, but they all have the same functionality. Some of them are not using all of these functionalities because they don't need them uh, or they don't have content within the country, uh, but it's pretty consistent. So whenever we have apply a fix, a new style, new feature, it gets applied automatically to all of them. Um, and and that's, uh, that's very useful because we have this consistency. We have a very good tool for regression testing that Dennis built which basically makes screenshots of every single page, and we're talking about thousands of pages, before we deploy something to production and compares it with the screenshots that were there before that. And in our QA, there is a comparison percentage. Our QA only reviews the pages that have some difference, and we go in and see what was changed there. If it's uh, what we expect it to be changed, or if it's uh, just a, a text change, because you know, at the same time, we often get text changes done by the content editors. Uh, because we don't even know how many content editors we have. The rated, tra great training, people keep training each other within the GE company and there are people around the globe all the time updating content on the, on the website. So from that point, uh, we're pretty good at keeping things consistent and training people and helping the, uh, the content managers help each other. They also have the ability to share content. So in industrial solutions, if you have a page for a product for Canada that's in French, the 
print, the France website can go in and pull content um, for that page, update it for their own market, and publish it immediately. Same is for pictures. They share content between different uh, countries, different languages, uh, make some tweaks. They, got not they, get, they get notifications when that original page got updated so they can update uh, their own page if needed. Uh, that's pretty good synchronization model that we did, which is uh, multi-way. So it's not even one way, it's multi-way. Everyone can, can share with everyone and everyone can, can use content. Saves a lot of time uh, for, for the content managers. Pretty regulated de deployment cycles. As Holly said, Thursday, that's the day we chose for deployment. Uh, everybody is aware what gets deployed when. Everybody's checking their website. And GE are supporting us as well with verifying changes, both on staging and on production environment. It's actually an internal script that Dennis built. So it's not a it's not a tool that's out there. We just we the number of sites was growing so fast. We had to find a way to uh, do regression testing, and it is always easy when you know what is out there and what you have to test. But with the amount of pages that were being added all the time without us even knowing, <laughs> uh, we couldn't keep track of who added what and you know what can what can break. Uh, especially considering that some of the content editors were pretty good with putting in HTML in the what you see, what you get editor, <laughs> making some fancy things. So we needed a tool that will actually help us test something that we don't even know. <laughs> so Dennis did all of that custom scripts uh, three years ago uh, that helped us. Um, I, I think they can be developed to, into a tool, but right now there are just some Drush commands that he runs and you know our QA gets access to a folder where they can see it, uh, the, the comparison results and look at the individual uh, screenshots that have differences. And the good thing is that these sites are responsive, so we need to screenshot, not just desktop, we need to screenshot uh, tablet, mobile. Um, we need to consider all of these breakpoints because they're mostly content. And you know, it's, it's important for us to support all of those users. And mobile users are more and more every day. But if you're interested in Drift site. <laughs> We'll look into it. I assume we'll need to put in a little bit of time that we have to make it <laughs> good enough for the for, for the open source community. <laughs>
And I don't think that you can say, well, unless you're already tracking those KPIs and saying, this is what we're spending now. And if I could talk to Holly and say, hey, Holly, how exactly, you know, how much are you spending now just so that I know, so that I can, you know, perhaps you can put together, uh, you know, discovery and, and come up with those numbers. Um, but usually I would say during the RFP process, until you kind of gain that trust, people aren't just going to open up and say, oh, yeah, here's how you sell from your position. So I guess that's just one question. Did you know this decentralized solution? Um, is this something you knew you were going to do going in? major but I can do math and when I saw what we were spending on all these different content management systems and all these different hosting platforms I mean it, it, again don't, don't don't give the exact number but it, it was enough I say I've saved enough money that if it was mega millions we saw it on billboards probably go buy a ticket I mean it, it's it's pretty significant and again that's not value to my end customer not none of that was valuable to my so that was what was really important to me. Um, there's that, there's just those cost, those licensing costs. I mean, that, that's a cost, but there's a lot of time when you start thinking about the amount of time that somebody spends entering content into a content management system or waiting an opportunity cost of waiting to update content and then a customer doesn't see what they were looking for and they move on to my competitor. I mean, that's an even bigger cost that, that now I, that I've lost. So, that was really important to me. I mean, from, from, from my perspective, I wanted to be economically attractive, um, but I wanted the front end to be attractive. So that was it's really important to me that my content managers see a front end that's really easy. What I want them is they have if they have five minutes between meetings, I want them to say, I've got five minutes, I can go update that page. Not, I only have five minutes, there's no way I'm gonna get paid to update this page. I need it to be easy or they won't that's what, something that has been really amazing about Drupal is everybody gets into it. You know, communication um, folks, marketing folks, the English major. I get in there and then I can make changes myself. Um, that's so easy. So that was that's a longer term cost that's a little harder to quantify, but it makes the biggest difference. Um, it's just making it really easy so people will use it. And it's interesting because Drupal's not known necessarily as being. Uh, uh, an easy system to use. I mean, you've seen probably the diagrams of people jumping off cliffs, uh, you know, in, in, in making updates. And I think that a lot of that, again, kind of comes back to, to making sure that the person that's developing your site or the agency that's developing your site has a really good understanding of Drupal, not only for just creating a website, but for perhaps making recommendations on improving the administrative interface. Um, because there are a lot of ways that, that, you know, you can change the theme around or a lot of different tools out there that make administering your websites easy as well. It's not just about, again, making the front side of the, uh, front side of the site for your customer looking pretty and making it easy, but focusing also on making Drupal itself and the administrative experience for your users a good one so that people will come in and actually use the tools um, on a daily basis. did also the design work for making it responsive, and I can say that it's 90% responsive. Why I say 90% is because there are some 
uh, pages that got migrated from the old site, which are not getting a lot of traffic, and it was uh, decided that it's not worth the effort to make them mobile friendly, like some calculators that were with some cash and some other things uh, that got just migrated as it is. Um, but the team for, in, uh, for industrial solutions put so much effort into redoing 90% of the content just so it can, it can be responsive. Yeah, uh, because the old side was not. So that part of the templates, we do hide some blocks okay. which are not usable for mobile. Uh, but I would say that the, um, all the, the templates and all the layouts are designed in a way so that they work responsive. Okay. And the blocks that get hidden are the blocks that really don't have any value on mobile uh, yet. Let's say if you have like some image map that you have to zoom in to yes. see anything. Well, that gets, are those yeah. That are only mm -hmm. Yeah, that, those get uh, styled differently on mobile devices, which is basically what responsive does. They become uh, listed links or some, um, some scaled images or some drop downs or something else that will allow the user to use the content on a mobile device. Or blogs get reordered. Get with all those folks in the kitchen, they're still yeah, pretty they're, much they're doing a very good job. So one thing that's important here is that uh, Drupal has a lot of capabilities. So if you give the end user all the capabilities, they may get lost and they may end up with some results that not necessarily look perfect on all the devices and not all the content managers can actually test all of those devices. So we give them enough capabilities so they can build their pages within the templates, but also make sure that we don't, we don't give them too much. So the, there's different types of user groups, but the content managers, they basically get a form to fill most of the time. So it's, it's as easy as filling in the form and going through different states of uh, waiting for review and you know, uh, then somebody else who gets more permissions can go in and publish it. But then there are users like Holly who get to do style pages and move blocks around and you know, do more things. But majority of the users don't get too many, <laughs> don't get too many features. Thank you, Holly. Ha, ha, ha.